Okay, uh, welcome back um, to the final session of this uh, symposium. It's my pleasure to introduce our uh, invited speaker for the last session, Professor Jane Simpson. Uh, Jane is a professor and chair of indigenous uh, linguistics here at the NU and also deputy director uh, of the ARC Center uh, of Excellence for the Dynamics of Language. Uh, Jane has published widely on topics in relation to uh, the structure and use of uh, Australian Aboriginal uh, languages, uh, including uh, Warumungu, uh, Kuruna, and in particular, Wolverine. Jane is part of a team here at the ANU working on a national indigenous uh, languages report, uh, studying uh, connections between language and well being. Uh, she has worked on revitalization and maintenance of indigenous languages in the Tennant Creek area, working on uh, dictionaries and uh, uh, longitudinal uh, study of Aboriginal children acquiring uh, Creoles and English and traditional language. Today, uh, Jane talks uh, about indigenous languages, well-being and public, let's say. Over to you, Jane. Well, thank you very much, Wayan. Thank, and thank you everyone for a whole lots of interesting presentations during this whole symposium. And as you'll see, I've somewhat changed what I was going to say because I've been so inspired by the ideas that have come up in a number of talks. And first, I'd like to acknowledge the first Australians on whose lands we work and on whose airways we are speaking through. I'm actually speaking to you from Wiradjuri country. And I'd like to pay my respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander colleagues and particularly to people from Mukor who are here. Um, and I was really delighted to hear the immediately preceding presentation because some of that means some of that I'll be echoing and it was just, it was terrific. Um, so before the invasion, First Nations people lived across the whole of Australia in hundreds of different groups speaking different languages. So here is the traditional Horton map, which shows Australia in 1788, where the whole continent is covered by people speaking different languages. The invasion of 1788 shattered the social structures with both through violence and through bringing new pandemics and new concepts of wellness and illness. And so today, there are only a few areas where people are still speaking traditional languages as their first language. Although in larger areas, people are speaking new languages like Creole that uh, Sonia and Heather and Greg were talking about. Um, and so this is languages in 2020 that here we have with the dotted um, shading where traditional first languages are still the first language and English is a second language. And in this cross hatched area, we have where people are speaking new languages and sometimes also traditional languages and English is a second language or a foreign language. And then you can see that for most of Australia, uh, English is the first language and traditional languages are learned as second languages. Now, at the start of colonization, the British colonists often made use of interpreters, but the combination of violence, dispossession and the new diseases resulted in rapid declines in the number of Aboriginal people around the colonies. And so once the British became well established in an area, they imposed English as the language of government and as the language to access services, whether it was shops, paid work, medical help, schooling, and so on. They saw no need to learn or recognize the languages of the First Nations. First Nations people had to learn English. But even so, as you've seen from this map, people showed great courage in enduring the invasion. And today there are about 800,000 people who identify as First Nations. 
of these, only about 60,000 are still speaking a First Nations language. Now, I've been lucky enough to work with Warramungal people in the Tennant Creek area of the Northern Territory. And I've heard a bit from them about the uses of traditional bush medicines and about traditional healers, but I really don't know all that much about it, about the whole system of knowledge. But I can say that just from observation, both have got their place in modern life in Tennant Creek. And as we heard in Mongolia, where herders still use traditional plant medicines, along with what people in the symposium were calling biomedicine. Now, and some of the reasons given are that they are available, that they're known to have particular effects and that they don't cost money. And that's certainly true in Central Australia as well. Uh, although some, even though they may not cost money, some of them are still traded. So here's an example of one plant which is boiled and used as an inhalant. In Waramongo, it's called Jungarai Jungarai, but in Wumbarani English, the local Creole in Tennant Creek, it's called Bush Vix. So Vix from the uh, European medicine, Vix Vapor Rub. Now, the word bush is often used to indicate that something belongs in the country in contrast with introduced things. So in Tennant Creek, people talk about bush oranges, bush lemons, bush passion fruit, bush potatoes, bush carrots. And all of these are Australian edible native plants. A term like bush vix indicates to me that Warramungal people have absorbed some aspects of modern biomedicine into their daily practice. And as I've just mentioned, traditional medicines are often called bush medicines. And collaborations with modern biomedical practitioners exist. So the picture here shows an example of Flinders University medical students visiting Tennant Creek and learning about bush medicines. Um, traditional healers exist. And as other people in this symposium have stressed, their importance, especially for mental health and well-being, is certainly being recognised and should be recognised. What struck me about the two Nangari traditional healers that I knew in Tennant Creek was that they integrated traditional approaches and modern biomedical approaches. So for example, one of them used to pay for aspirin and use it herself frequently because she knew that aspirin worked, that it alleviated pain or headaches. And sometimes the collaboration is more formalised, as in the Anangu um, Yankunjujara Pichinjara lands, the APY lands, where the MPY Women's Council is actually working with Nangari traditional healers um, to collaboratively help people. Now, I want to go back in time to the first pandemics. So I call them pandemics because they spread across the countries of many First Nations people. There were several devastating smallpox outbreaks. And it's heartbreaking to think about how people would have felt when the disease took hold. As you can see from the slide, there are records of the panic. And the panic would be compounded by not being able to place the disease in traditional systems of knowledge in a way that allowed them to combat it effectively. So uh, as you can see here, panic and just hideous suffering. In 1840, missionary linguists documented on the Adelaide Plains word for, words for smallpox, muya, pustule. And they, in their definition, they included um, information about the spread of the 1830s epidemic. So asserting that it came from the East and how many people died from it. And the missionaries noted they have no remedy against it except the Muya Party, the smallpox song, 
which they learnt from the Eastern tribes. And by singing of that, the disease is believed to be prevented or stopped in its progress. And as we've heard in other talks in this symposium, singing has been a very important part of many traditional medicine systems. Now, in terms of biomedicine, smallpox vaccines began, began to be available in Australia from 1803, but not many of them. And production didn't actually begin until 1847, well after the major 1830 outbreak. And we have no records of smallpox vaccines being administered to Aboriginal people. The next pandemic that I want to mention is the Spanish influenza, which we've heard a great deal about recently because of the fact that it came from Europe after World War I. The effect in some Aboriginal communities was devastating. So in a Queensland community, an Aboriginal settlement, Barambar, even though they had initial attempts at quarantining of 606 people, 596 caught the flu and 69 died. Again, first hand accounts such as the one on the slide emphasize the panic that people felt. And they adopted a traditional approach, which we could call self quarantining, namely they fled from the settlement into the bush. But the tragedy was when they fled from the bush, a number of them had already been infected. And so, as it says here, two or three hundred became ill in the bush. And then it says that officials found the greatest difficulty in getting them back to the centre for treatment. An awful thing about this is first that self-quarantining was too late, but secondly, that the centralising in the lock-up hospitals probably helped spread the disease further. And the third illness rather than pandemic that I want to mention is kidney failure. So from the 1980s, it became obvious that Central Australian Aboriginal people suffer very high rates of kidney failure. Most of the people that I began working with in the 1980s are dead now. Many have died from kidney failure. People would often ask me why this was happening, what was the cause, what they could do about it. And of course, I didn't know what to tell them. It was just awful. In the 1980s, Aboriginal people in Tennant Creek who suffered renal failure had to go all the way to Adelaide and live there to receive dialysis treatment. And this was a terrible hardship for people who were so connected with their families and their countries. Some gave up on treatment, some died in Adelaide, others made new lives there. Still others fought long and hard for the introduction of dialysis units, first in Alice Springs and then in Tennant Creek. So people learned about transplants. In the 1990s, I had a small job for a medical anthropologist just to find out about what Aboriginal health workers knew about kidney failure and in Tennant Creek. They were all really eager to learn about it, but there were large language barriers. And one example is fluid. They defined fluid as bad stuff you got in your body, knowing that with kidney failure, you get fluid, you get fluid on your lungs, your liver gets large and your body breaks down. But they didn't connect that fluid with kidney patients having to restrict their fluid intake i.e. what they drank and how much they could drink. And I found that deeply disturbing. People were desperate to know what was happening to them and why, but they just didn't have the information. About the same time, we had the AIDS pandemic. And there was great fear that if AIDS got into remote communities, it would kill many people. And some of you will remember the Grim Weeper campaign which was pretty effective in non-Indigenous communities. But some Aboriginal health professionals thought that it wasn't very effective in Aboriginal communities because it didn't say what you had to do. 
they wanted a much more explicit campaign. And so an Aboriginal health professional, Graceland Smallwood from North Queensland, is generally attributed with having conceived the idea of condo man. And you can see on the slide, the, uh, one of the ads for, of condo man. There were many posters involving condo man. And this messaging was very effective. And in the 1980s, mercifully, AIDS didn't become the killer in Aboriginal communities that we thought it would be. Condo Man posters were sporadically translated into First Nations languages, but it was pretty sporadic. It was mostly done, not officially, but as part of vernacular literacy training. However, the posters, in any case, were a good conversation starter with um, uh, potential patients. Um, now, uh, we move on um, to COVID-19. Everyone realises that just as with AIDS, COVID-19 has the potential to be a killer in Aboriginal communities. And as you can see from this sign, some Aboriginal communities have shut themselves off in self-quarantining, but making use of Australian law. And in terms of communication, you can see that the government is making an effort to provide resources in Indigenous languages. And here's an example of having an Indigenous person, a paramedic, giving um, a message, a video shot, a video and audio for her mob about the importance of COVID-19 um, safety behaviour. And that is in English. Now, there are also attempts to put it into other average to Aboriginal languages and also to use it, do it through radio, which is a good medium to get across to people in remote communities. And so here are examples from Anindiliagwa. So we've got protect our communities, mental health support and stay COVID-3, do the three things. So that's one language, Anindiliagwa. And if you go to the website, www.health.gov.au, you'll find that actually there are only a few types of resources listed in Indigenous languages. So for Pichinjara, Torres Strait Creole and Walbury, there are resources on both COVID-19 and on cervical screening. For Aliawara Eastern Aranda Hintabi literature, there's only cervical screening. And then in a number of languages, there is only COVID-19. But of course, there are masses of resources in other languages on everything from the National Bowel Health, the Bowel Cancer Screening Project, to aging, to respite, to all sorts of things. So the amount of material available from the government health website on Indigenous languages is pretty limited. So, um, it seems that for effective control of pandemics and of diseases like kidney failure, people have to know what the risks are and what they can do about it. But to know this, you've got to receive timely information. So it's no good having the information several months later. You've got to have accurate information. And we've seen a lot of discussion over COVID about the lack of accurate information, for instance, over mask wearing. You've got to have clear information and you've got to have concise information. And as we've heard, Google Translate is maybe not the most reliable way of getting information that is high stakes, like this type of information. You also have to have information that people can trust. And that's why it's so important to have people like the Indigenous paramedic, uh, who <coughs> uh, people can relate to and are more likely to trust. And finally, the information has to make sense to people. 
So they have to be able to fit it into their own frameworks of understanding of health and well-being. And what I've, what I've shown earlier or argued earlier is that actually people these days have mixed frameworks, that they recognise both the value of traditional medicine and traditional practices and the value of modern biomedicine, and they're trying to bring them together what's effective for what. Now, uh, this brings me then to the topic of language rights. So language is used both to communicate ideas, our communicative rights, and to express associations, to mark our identity as a Creole speaker, as an Aboriginal person, as an English speaker, as an English speaker of German heritage, and so on. And these are our, these are emblematic rights. But language is also the means of passing on ways of living and thinking to the next generation. So education rights. And these three rights are really important. For Indigenous languages in Australia in 2020, we have these three functions and three rights that I've mentioned, and we have different situations. So for languages as means of communication, we have traditional Indigenous languages, which are still spoken by children in remote communities and in the diaspora. So in the cities like Alice Springs or Darwin or Adelaide, there are lots of First Nations people who speak different languages. And then there are also new Indigenous languages like Creole that Greg and Sonia and Heather were talking about. And then there is language as emblem. So traditional indigenous languages may or may not be spoken in everyday talk, but they're still very important to everyone. And then we have new indigenous languages, which are also emblematic, marking people as speakers of Creole. And then finally, we have the uses of traditional or new languages in education. And this is rarely recognised. And we've been lucky to hear from the people from Nuko about you know, a really successful example of bringing in what people's home languages is into the school context to share ideas and information. Now, in terms of recognising these rights, Internationally, we have the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which was um, agreed on in 1976 by the United Nations. Australia didn't sign up until, until 1980, and it has some relevant articles. So in the case of having criminal charges, everyone should have the right to be informed promptly and in detail in a language which they understand of the nature and cause of the charge against them. And they should have the free assistance of an interpreter if they can't understand or speak the language used in the court. So this is what I've been referring to as communication rights, the right to receive information in a language you understand. But notice that this is just restricted to legal high stakes um, situations. And then there is the right to use your own language. So this is in a way an emblematic right, but also a communication right, that minority people should have the right to use their own language. Unfortunately, the covenant doesn't say anything about the right to receive other information in your own language. So no right to talk to governments in your own language, no right to talk in hospitals in your own language or get an interpreter there. So um, in 1979, an indigenous public servant, Gloria Brennan, wrote a report on translation needs and she really urged the importance of translators and interpreters for getting across high stakes information. However, uh, there was 
some effort in the 1980s with translation and interpreting courses in Bachelor College in Darwin. But there was long term resistance to it. And I think the resistance can best be encapsulated by what Dennis Burke, who was the Northern Territory Chief Minister in 1999, so 20 years later, this is what he said. He rejected the need for an Aboriginal interpreter service, saying, to my mind, that is akin to providing a wheelchair for someone who should be able to walk. And he said it was a disgrace that Aborigines still needed inter interpreters or translators. And in a sense, it is a disgrace in that it shows how poor the education has been in terms of giving people access to the dominant language um, in schools. Now today, the federal government says in print that interpreting is critical for effective engagement between government and indigenous people uh, whose traditional language is not English. And it funds helps fund interpreting services in some places. So we have the Aboriginal Interpreter Service in the Northern Territory, and we have the Aboriginal um, uh, Interpreting WA, which used to be the Kimberley Interpreting Service. And in principle, the federal government also supports language use by funding the Indigenous interpreting sector to provide, train and accredit Indigenous interpreters. But in practice, there are far too few Indigenous interpreters and far too few people have access to training. So I mean, this is an area where we really need to work harder. And um, Again, people from Nuko will be able to talk about this, especially with respect to um, Creole. Um, but we also need to go beyond interpreting. We need to share information so that we have shared systems of knowledge in which information, important information about pandemics or kidney failure can be fitted. And the best way to do that is through education. But what we need is both ways education. And on the slide, I've put up uh, what I think is a very important statement by Yongo educators from Arnhem Land. They said, and this was a long time, this was in 1990, through the remote area teacher education program, we Yongo see our chance of getting loose and getting rid of the harness and the bridle that the balanda, that's the non-Aboriginal person, has long used to steer us in the direction that they wanted us to go. And that's the way of balanda. Through this type of training, the remote area teacher training, we have a chance of getting educational skills so that we can work in our communities and put our qualifications and what we've learned into use in our homeland communities. We Yongo would like to gather enough understanding and knowledge about Balanda law and system so as to understand and live with both laws in two worlds. This will also make communications better between Yongo and Balanda. And I'd suggest that this is true not only of laws and systems uh, of government, but also of health and biomedicine. And this is not to discount Jungle knowledge in any way. As another uh, very famous statement by a very famous Jungle educator wrote, um, we need both ways education. And she said that Gunma is a still lagoon. The water circulates silently underneath and there are lines of foam circulating across the surface. The swelling and the retreating of the tri tides and the season floods can be seen in the two bodies of the water. 
water is often taken to represent knowledge in Jungian philosophy. What we see happening in the school is a process of knowledge production where we have two different cultures, Ballander and Jungian, working together. Cultures need to be presented in a way where each one is preserved and respected. This theory is Yiriche. And so this, I think, is the vision for bringing together different systems also of knowledge about health and well-being um, so that we have both ways understanding of these. So, um, um, my conclusion is first that we need to share information about illnesses and about the risks and what we can do about it. Um, second, that we need to receive timely, accurate, clear and concise information in languages that we understand from people we trust. And thirdly, that we need to be able to fit that information into our ideas about health and well-being. And I want to con conclude in memory of one of my teachers who was diagnosed with renal failure in her early 20s, had to leave Tennant Creek for dialysis in Adelaide um, in 1987. And she told me that she cried in the plane all the way to the South Australian border because she didn't know what was going to happen to her. But just past the border, she decided she had to find out what this disease was that was killing her. And so she did her best to understand about kidney failure, end stage renal disease. She became a great advocate for dialysis closer to home so she pushed for dialysis in Alice Springs so she could leave Adelaide. And then she managed to push for dialysis in Tennant Creek. She was one of the longest surviving renal patients in Central Australia. 33 years on a transplant and on the machine. Farewell. Thank you, Jean. Um, so, okay, uh, we now open uh, the floor for questions. Um, if you have questions, uh, you can just now say it orally, perhaps. I didn't see any question in the chat box. Hi, Okay. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, okay, Nora, you, you can just say. Thank you very much, Jane. It is very uh, informative. I have a question. Uh, it, is it possible to transmit to the important disease information um, in language to key people in the community, such as, such as elders? so they can explain explain the key like information and the gravity of the information and then spread the messages more easily through the communities along with the science and the radio ads um good question in many places there are aboriginal controlled medical services and i think it due to them probably that both the AIDS and the COVID has been you know, so far touch wood um, limited because that's Aboriginal controlled medical services are medical services controlled generally by Aboriginal elders. So they are involved in running the medical center and they are great people for talking with the community about it. That's really good, thank you, Jim. Any other questions? Uh, Nara? Yes. Oh, thank you, Jane, for, for the very uh, uh, good talk and uh, moving talk. Um, 
so I was wondering, uh, you know, in terms of language, uh, spreading the information, especially uh, about particular disease and this time, for instance, about the pandemic, right? Um, if there's any way, it's probably related to, to uh, uh, Nora's question, probably. So is there any way of indigenous way of uh, 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 sort of trans transmitting or spreading the, uh, the, the, the information? So for instance, in, uh, in Mongolia, in Inner Mongolia, for instance, they have a, a kind of an artistic way of, of uh, spreading the, 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 the information so by singing. So the, the information is actually folded into poem and singing and uh, uh, so, and you know, and nowadays through WeChat, so it's spread everywhere. Uh, and so I just wondered, you know, Aboriginals, uh, uh, if, the, if there is no fixed, uh, so much uh, written language, then it might be a good way of oral kind of in a, in a poem or in a, in a song format to spread the information. I mean, it seems to me like a very good idea. I haven't seen that done, but um, maybe people from Muko have um, examples. Uh, and so at Muko, how was um, COVID-19, how was the um, information about that transmitted? So over to you, Greg. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, it was very challenging. Um, I think one of the things that stood out when COVID started was there was really no coordination in how to, in what information to translate, who was going to translate it. There was really high levels of anxiety in the community. Um, but yeah, I think if we had waited for something to come down through, say, the territory government or federal government, we would still be waiting probably. So everybody here was really anxious. These We recognised how important the information was. So a lot of different communities took it upon themselves to do their best at translating and disseminating information, which was really good, but it's not how things should have been done. So it kind of got, you know, we you couldn't guarantee that the people doing the translating were doing a sufficient job, even though they were trying their best. The other issue was, you know, here locally, the clinic would say to the language centre or to us, oh, translate these materials we need. No, they wouldn't say translate these materials. They'd say, can you produce some COVID resources in Creole? And the issue for us was we'd say, well, what do you want us to translate? And they didn't understand that we actually needed, needed to be told what the correct information was to translate. There was sort of like this weird discussion locally of like, well, you just find something and just put it into Creole, but we're not health experts. So we wanted to make sure that we were creating resources or doing translations that were based on the best information that the health professionals or health department wanted to be put into language. So yeah, it was really messy. It was really poorly done. Eventually some stuff did come out from um, the NT government and a little bit from federal, but it wasn't well coordinated and it wasn't well thought through. But thanks to community efforts, a lot of information did come out, but more sort of as a from the ground up type thing. Um, uh, following that, uh, to Greg and Jane, uh, so it seems to me that you have, uh, you know, in terms of translation to the indigenous languages, so, you know, this requires a kind of lexicon uh, in the target languages, right? So it seems to me that there's a gap uh, in the Aboriginal uh, languages of certain lexicon related to pandemics. Um, because of is that because you know uh, at least for example in in my context in Indonesian languages, uh, you know people in the past in the ancient past you do have uh, you know communities living together in large you know in particular uh, area. Is that because uh, you know in in Australian context uh, Aboriginal people live in small groups and 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 nomadic in a way, so you do not have, you didn't have this uh, lexicons, elaborate lexicon of pandemic, or, or is there any, relating to Nara's question, 
about oral stories about past ancient pandemic uh, that's transmitted across generation about how to handle uh, pandemics, for example. Any comment on that? I guess um, Australia, the Australia's ecosystem differs so greatly. Where I work in Central Australia, people traditionally were in small family groups. And yes, they did gather together in larger groups for ceremonies, but the local um, plant and animal life wasn't, um, abund and water wasn't abundant enough to support many people being together for a long time. It was actually very different in, say, the coast of South Australia or um, in Arnhem Land on the coast where people did have much more dense habitation. Um, the, 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 certainly the, the words for um, smallpox appear to have spread across Australia. So, and it's some of them, I mean, allegedly, actually one of them is related to a Macassan word. So people on the um, northern coast may have contracted illnesses or um, major illnesses from Macassan traders. But um, yeah, that would be, I, I haven't, I mean, I haven't heard stories about the equivalence of pandemics, but um, I have heard stories where of ancestral beings causing different kinds of illnesses. Um, do you want to comment further, Greg or John? Um, my comment would just be to say that I, what we had most difficulty with translations is not something like pandem pandemic, which I felt in Creole you could get across with the term like a big sickness, you know, affecting lots of people. You can explain that fairly easily in a way that makes sense. But it's terms that you don't really have equivalents for in Indigenous languages like germ and virus. They were so crucial to the health messaging, what a germ is, what a virus is, but because you can't see them, they're microscopic that requires an element of trust in populations that if, if you say it as someone, this is what a virus is, or this is a germ is, but you can't see it, it requires who's listening to you to trust that you're giving them the right information. And those two yes. concepts yes. like germ and virus were just such a foundation to all the health messaging. So if you don't believe or understand what a germ or a virus is, then you don't know why you're supposed to cover your mouth when you cough. You don't understand why you're supposed to be 1.5 meters away from someone. So to me, it was those concepts that were really kind of more crucial ones to the health messaging that we were trying to do around COVID. I'll, I'll give another example of, which is um, an example from Arnhem Land where they began describing kidneys as the equivalent of petrol filters. And, um, talking about what happens when the kidney gets clogged as being like what happens when a petrol filter gets clogged. And that metaphor turned out to be really useful for explaining problems with renal failure elsewhere. So sharing metaphors or an, an analogies that work uh, is I think an important part of the health process. Yes, Nara, again. Okay. Yes, uh, so I was just uh, going to, uh, you know, uh, uh, talking about the same same kind of thing as Jen already mentioned. So the metaphor actually works uh, 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 works very well. So we don't have to, uh, for general information, we don't have to talk about, uh, you know, what what is germ. Uh, basically to, to spread the, the importance of washing the hands or, or, or you know, uh, this kind of uh, simple thing, it can be done in a normal, normal, a concept or language or even it was metaphor right so if we were too much focusing on the scientific translation of the information then we, we, we wouldn't get anywhere uh, with uh, or at least very slow to get uh, uh, to, to, to achieve uh, the goal 
Angela. Yep. Hi, uh, thank you, Jane, for very informative uh, presentation. So I have a question. Um, it's about uh, the relationship between the language and the belief system. So as you just um, said, so if the overall belief system uh, of health and well-being is quite different from the Western um, concepts of uh, bio, how biomedicine affect human body and uh, overall well-being. So how how can how can you um, fit the health information uh, such as in the context of COVID-19 to fit with the belief system of the local people? So um, the translation of the language can work well within the social cultural context of the belief system. So any comments on, on that? Um, I guess what I'd say is that people are generally fairly practical. If they see that something works, like aspirin, then they will adopt it. And similarly, um, you know, there was a great deal of concern in the early days about um, um, of kidney transplants that uh, because in various Aboriginal belief systems there are particular properties associated with kidneys, um, people were saying, oh, well, maybe Aboriginal people won't accept transplants or so forth. But in my experience, um, when people realised that transplants meant they didn't have to go on dialysis and they could lead an almost normal life, you know, people were quite prepared to be practical and pragmatic and um, not only accept transplants, but work incredibly hard to try to get a transplant. Yes, yeah, thank you for that uh, explanation. I just recently have some friend uh, in the States um, telling me about a quite extreme example of someone when he was very close to death from COVID-19, he told the nurse uh, who was caring for him that he didn't believe in COVID-19. He thought COVID-19 is a, uh, a conspiracy uh, of the government, yet he actually experienced all the um, conditions of a course by due to COVID-19. So I just wonder how what people believe can kind of alter and affect their experience of illness. So he, well, he sure. knew something wrong with him, but he couldn't believe uh, it was so-called COVID-19. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that your belief that what you believe has a strong effect on what you do about your health, um, what you're prepared to accept. Um, I agree. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? One, two, three. It's very quiet, very tired. I think we have been through. <laughs> No one else okay. asking questions. Sorry, I'm asking all, all, all many questions. Um, uh, it's also uh, related to the uh, previous talk by uh, Greg uh, and uh, his group. Um, is uh, one of the things I uh, realized through uh, uh, both of your talks uh, uh, is that you know how appalling actually the policy in Australia has been, even though uh, you know we are perceived, perceived to be a welfare. A state, right? And so it's, it made me feel very sad, actually. So my question is now, uh, you know, how how uh, government or how we, sh we we can do actually support the kind of uh, you know the education in in in, in Aboriginal language. And is there any any uh, so, sort of government support that, uh, on the move? <laughs> 
Um, well, maybe I'll hand that over to Greg, who's currently more involved in it. Um, <clears throat> well, I can give you the micro picture and you can probably give the macro picture, Jane. So no, there's no moves really. I guess in the Northern Territory context where there are still strong Indigenous languages, it has improved because 12 years ago there was a really horrific government education policy that was that the first four hours of teaching in every school in each school day had to be in English. That was an explicit policy and that was lobbied against and it was quite disgraceful. That's now long gone and there has been a big turnaround in attitudes. So now things like the program we're doing where we're working with all the classes in the school, like the school's actually really positive about it and it's going well and there's people in the department who are really enthusiastic about it and there's politicians who are really supportive of what we're doing. But none of it is translating to increased funding and actual support in that way. So our program is funded through a local Aboriginal organisation that gets a pool of federal funding to use as it wants. So the only reason our program is funded is because the community, the local community organisation thinks it's important. It's not coming through the government. Even though they're supportive and they think it's great, I think they're kind of like, oh, we're glad someone's there to do it so we don't have to fund it or figure out how to do it. So things have improved in the last decade, but it's not really translating into real effort to support these sorts of first language programs. That's my experience locally anyway. Dane? I'll just add to that, that the other side of it is the crying need for trained Indigenous interpreters and trained Indigenous teachers. And you know, in the 1980s, there was a remote area teacher education program funded by the federal government, which in allowed Aboriginal people to get teacher training and spend most of the time on their home community and go for intensives to bachelor college. And as a result of that program, you know, there were a lot of Aboriginal teachers in schools, which was fantastic. But that program was basically disbanded and so now, you know, the last I heard, there were fewer Aboriginal teachers in Northern Territory schools, trained Aboriginal teachers, than there were in the 1990s, which is deeply shocking because you know, education improves when you've got people who you believe that you can, you know, who are like you as teachers. It makes it seem possible to you. And the, the other side is the, the need for much more interpreter training um, and uh, you know, access to interpreter training for the speakers of Aboriginal languages who by and large live in remote communities. So those are the two things that I, I think really are... Um, yeah. uh, they're two, also, we've been working on the National Indigenous Languages Report as uh, was mentioned in the introduction and you know, part of the um, thrust of that report is to say that if you want to keep languages strong and if you want communities to flourish then you absolutely need more access to um, good primary, secondary and tertiary education in um, yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, we have questions in the chat box. Uh, Mary's uh, question, I think it's already answered. Has any of this messaging been done through song? I think it's already a question by Nara earlier and discussed, right? Do you wanna add any comment on that, Jane? Uh, I haven't seen it, but again, maybe Greg or uh, Leslie or um, uh, John Jacon, maybe you guys have seen Messaging through song? No, okay. All right. John has a question. You unmute your mic, John. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, all languages change, but languages 
a change to uh, cope with or to work with the, the life situation of people. And so the life situations of people in, in Aboriginal communities seem to me to be going through massive change you know, over a relatively short time. So I'm just wondering if you've got any comment on how the languages are coping with that or what sort of strain that puts on a language. Like, so for instance, coming up with the concept or both people understanding the concept of virus and having a word for it. Um, so yeah, what, what an impact it has that things are changing so rapidly on the viability and strength of language. There are a lot of borrowings that people use, but not necessarily in with the same meanings that they would have in English. So uh, blue for fluid was used in tenant creep, but it means what you have in your body from kidney failure rather than the stuff that you drink mm -hmm. would be an example of them. Um, so there are all these false friends around. Um, I don't, Greg, do you have further thoughts? Mm, no, not really. Okay. Um, so next question, uh, Carol. Carol, unmute yourself. Okay. Yeah, I am coming. Sorry. <laughs> I know that we're running out of time. Someone just rang me and I had to tell them to wait. Um, well, there was just two things. One is I came across something that was a bit discouraging for me about language in Papua New Guinea, but it's a, it's a good thing. I just wondered if it's an, a cultural problem anywhere else. The elementary school, they promoted that they would use local languages. And but what was happening was that people were using talk pigeon, which is more the equivalent of Creole. And then what was even more difficult was that the community themselves felt that one reason they didn't do it in local language was because one child was a, from a family that was not from the local language. And so they wanted to make that child feel included, which is a lovely thought. But I don't know if people have come up against that as a problem in early years schooling, actually being in local language. But then my other question is more, is there anything you can um, suggest? It's on a totally different topic. I've just been asked, it's only for two days that I've been asked to contribute something to the Aboriginal Medical Health Research Centre. And it's from an Indigenous colleague I worked with in the University of Wollongong. And she's bringing in um, people from all over New South Wales, from rural medical, um, remote medical centres, who are being funded in relation to suicide prevention. So really, this is a different aspect of well-being. But so I'm just making this comment now in case anybody has any information about language relating to suicide um that they could let me know at any time in the present or the future or anything relating to cultural attitudes to suicide in new south wales particularly but languages and cultures of you know the remote parts of new south wales just because that would be good background information for me but also from my friend Leslie Kerwin, who's got a position as a suicide prevention officer, maybe I can give her some information from linguists at some point that would be useful. Um, yeah. I, I can't say anything about that from my own experience, but I can say that the NPY Women's Council um, had a project called Uti Kulinjaku which was basically sitting, which is so in other words, sitting with Pichinjara, Yankunjara people. And basically what they did was talk with them about the signs and um, language used around um, uh, mental illness, about when people felt depressed, how to identify it. And they came up with a really fabulous poster, which is on their website. Um, oh. oh, just which is just 
showing, you know, how people look, how people gesture when they're in different states of mind. Yeah. And, um, and also the Pichinjara words that they used for that. And, that, and I gather that you know, the poster as an artifact is a useful thing, but what was really important was the process of creating that poster. Okay. Of, um, yeah. Sitting and discussing it. So that would be nice to have that information to pass on. Thank you, Jane. I haven't, yeah. maybe I can get it by email in more detail. Yeah. But yeah. Thank you. I just thought I'd throw it in at the end. Sorry, it's not a very positive thing, but it's a positive thing that there's some funding for, for, um, for suicide prevention in Aboriginal communities. So um, I, I, thought, I suddenly thought maybe someone, so if any of you come up with any other thoughts from other communities in Australia, that would be great to have that as an example to pass on to Leslie. Thanks. <laughs> I can see in the chat that, I can see in the chat that Greg's just put up some references for you. Okay, thank you, Greg. Thank you very much. Okay, good. Okay, we are over the time. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, you know, uh, note and, you know, from Greg. Uh, so we just uh, uh, wrap up and, and thank you very much, Jane, for the uh, excellent topic for this, uh, you know, last session. It's, uh, you know, late in the afternoon. Uh, and we already have uh, three days in a row with uh, fabulous talks and good discussion on the interconnection between language, health, and well-being. Uh, it, you know, it's a fascinating topic and an ongoing discussion, I think, you know, outside uh, this uh, forum. Uh, hopefully, keep in touch, I'll, you know, and, and thank you again on behalf of the uh, organizing committee, uh, thank you again for your participation and staying on uh, in front of the computer. Uh, okay, for the whole day, actually. So, thank you again and see you next time. <laughs>